Oh, 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 my good friends. Who doesn't love to play in the mud? <laughs> I'm this is Roger, Mud Fossil University. The muddiest guy in the world. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about mud today because this is a mud puddle that started here and it's moving. <laughs> I mean, this is crazy. Every day I wake up and it's like, I'm in Never Never Land. I mean, I, it's just unbelievable the things that are on this earth. Nobody can explain. And that is where I love to go. <laughs> that is, I mean, I'm just in happy land today. I remember when I was, when, when my kids were young. I, this is what I did my whole life, is I was a troubleshooter. And, and I was a field engineer. They call it field engineering. It means they put the stuff out in the field, the equipment, and it doesn't work. Well, you got to go out and figure out why, and then re-engineer it to work. <laughs> and so my son, I'm at a place with him. It was like a little store or something. And there's this other little kid there. They're both like five, six years old. My son, Max. <laughs> he walks up to the kid. He goes, hi, right, my name is Max. This is my father. His name is Roger. He's a fixer. <laughs> it was hilarious, but that's what I did. I just loved to come up with a solution for problems. I just it just absolutely fascinates me. And but a boom, this was one that really really kicked me off. And I have the answer for this, and nobody else will. I can guarantee you of that. You'll see that in a minute. Okay, so she's just arrived at the world's only moving giant mud puddle. Well, she rises and says, wow, what does it smell like? It smells pretty rough here. Well, what is that smell? That smell, Every once in a while, yeah. rotten egg smell. Remember that, I'm gonna show you something in a minute. It's a good whip. There it is. The world's first mud spring ever documented to move. It's okay, the world's first mud spring ever documented to move. First of all, whoops. <laughs> first camera ever documented to move. All right, now, what's coming out of there? First of all, she said she could smell rotten eggs. That's hydrogen sulfide, the smell of rotten eggs. It's pretty well understood. That's the gas that causes it. The second thing that's coming out of here is carbon dioxide in copious amounts, large volumes of carbon dioxide. They said if you fell down in there and you couldn't get out, you would die because you wouldn't have, there's no air in there. They put a candle down and there it just goes out because there's no air. Now, also there is this layering around the edge, which I always show, which is literally membrane layering if you follow the mud fossil philosophy. And secondly, he also talks about a perched water table. What does that mean, perched water table? Well, a perch is like something sitting on top of a flat surface. I did it perched up here. Well, that's the water table perched on a flat surface because that flat surface is a membrane layer. And guess what's under that membrane layer? This, a lung. And guess what's in that lung? This, a giant alveoli hole. And guess what's attached to that giant alveoli? Another one. And they have holes that go deep inside them. You could never get to the bottom of that hole. They can't plug this hole. And then when they try to put something in here to keep it from moving, it jumps across that little barrier. I'm going to show this in the microscope. I could show this exactly in mud fossils. And they say, oh, big deal, you know, about mud fossils. So what? Who cares about rocks turning, you know, things turn into rocks? Well, there's a lot more to it. The earth itself is a mud fossil. I'm not kidding you. I am not kidding you. I'm going to show this, in, and I already have. It's just that people cannot, cannot let their mind roam into a realm that they've been told to disregard. Basically, that's it. You said there's a myth. Don't go there. Don't think about that. It's just not real. You're crazy if you go there. People are going to treat you like an insane person, and that is a fact. <laughs> that, I can tell you, is true. The rest of it is all wrong. Okay, she rolls up, she says, boy, it smells like rotten eggs. Hydrogen sulfide is that rotten egg smell. They just added this to the new breath test to test your microbiome. This is where I'd study bacteria, the microbiome, health, 
and everything that you are is in health is related to breaking through these membranes and attacking the good stuff that's on the other side of the membrane and that is related to bacteria it's almost exclusively your health is bacteria if you don't have the bacteria there you don't create the slime you don't create the enzymes and then you ha end up with things dying and creating hydrogen sulfides and carbon dioxides and all kinds of other chemistry that is related to degradation and this is one of the things and it, it, it pertains to having some kind of bad overgrowth in your gut and the other stuff is related to to bacteria dying in your your intestinal system and then you get diarrhea and all kinds of things that's just a whole nother issue but everything there's nothing that's one thing I want to keep saying this over and over if if a guy says oh I'm trained this or I'm a trained this or I'm a trained that well big deal it's just one thing is nothing it's absolutely nothing you have to know everything to know anything because everything is tied together there's nothing that is one thing you say to the earth I'm a geologist well the earth isn't geology the earth is biology so if you didn't know biology you wouldn't know that so just because you read a bunch of books that said, if you read these books, you're smart about this subject. No, you're not. You have to say, what is that subject when I relate to hydrogen sulfide to somebody's lungs, to the earth, to a mud puddle that's moving? This is huge, huge landscape of things to consider. It's not just one thing, because not one thing is one thing. Nothing is one thing. Okay, my friends, this is going to be amazing, I hope. You know I study the earth. I study the products that are in the earth, and I claim they are all biological. 100% of the earth is biology. And what does a moving mud puddle have to do with a study on gases? Well, I'm going to show you what it has to do with it. Hydrogen sulfide is one of the gases we're going to be talking about, and also, which is this um, extremely flammable, highly toxic, smells like rotten eggs. Well, guess what? Not only hydrogen sulfide, but methanes as well are found, well, let's take a look. All right, the two gases found at construction and demolition debris landfills, methanes, which are hydrocarbons, carbon is what we are based on, hydrogen adheres to the carbon because it's got four extra electrons, it can hold four extra carbons, I mean hydrogens, which makes it extremely explosive, and hydrogen sulfide also has a couple of hydrogens that can attach to the sulfur so it makes it extremely explosive and these are the byproducts of bi biological decomposition everybody knows that you take any kind of of um oily rags and so forth and put them under and cover them up with oil is nothing more than what's in your body and you cover it up and seal it under and it'll get spontaneous combustion it'll be it'll become explosive that's what volcanoes are. <laughs> I, and that's why I'm doing the, the, the gas study. And you won't believe when I started doing the gas study and the atomic study of what comes out of volcanoes. The first one that popped up was Mount Spur. <laughs> that's my last name, Spur. Guess what? It's a rectum. Okay, my friends, this is Physics Girl, and she is, she's got a, like almost 2 million subscribers, and she is out trying to solve this problem of the world's only moving mud pile. Well, I know why it's moving, I'll show you why it's moving, and I have an exact representation of why it's moving, and I can explain everything she's talking about, including the gases, the flow, all of the things that they're very, very confused about. Now listen, she's showing up there, first thing she's going to talk about is the gases. Here's where it goes. Now, don't forget, this is physics, girl. Fair use. The salted sea. Wow, look, there's the rose. Ooh, I just got. It does smell pretty Ooh. well. Yeah, it's a rotten egg smell. Every once in a while, you get that. All right, rotten egg smell. Well, what is a rotten egg smell? It's hydrogen sulfide. Well, guess what? I'll explain exactly why that rotten egg smell is there. But let's just keep going. Good whiff. 
there it is. The world's first mud spring ever documented to move. It's basically just this pool of water right here. It doesn't well, there's really- a, there's a perched ground water table. Over on the eastern side, there's a lot of rock that was put there because what the mud spring does is carves up the ground as it travels and leaves behind this giant sunken crater, which as you can imagine, is a bit dangerous to not fill in. As we stood there staring at this giant hole in the ground, gurgling like the planet talking to you, we learned the story of how the mud spring came to be, and along the way, I noted three particularly crazy moments. One was a time when the mud spring was over 100 feet across. Another was a time when the mud spring jumped 60 feet in a day. And the third was the most terrifying moment when the mud spring blew water 100 feet in the air. And so let's get to the story on our journey to figuring out why this darn thing is moving. I'm Diana, you're watching Physics Girl, and I love me a geology mystery. Like the massive magnetic stripe scientists found on the ocean floor. That was a whole thing. But this story is even more confusing because the mystery is ongoing. The mystery all started in 1953 when a bubbling hole of mud popped up through the ground on a farm. 1953, it was about three or 400 yards that way. Yeah. And it sat there for you know, decades. This is Sean Rizzuto, senior transportation engineer at Caltrans and father to two daughters that he wants to see get interested. Now, before she goes on any further, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this is, this is uh, concerning. Because if it sat there for decades and decades, it appears that this is a new manifestation driven by a couple of different possibilities, and I will explain those as we go forward here. But this is very concerning. Interested in science. We got along well. The farmer was aware of this mud pot, but wasn't too worried because those are actually kind of common in the area. There's a large carbon dioxide reservoir. All right, remember that. These are common in the area, these mud pots. They bubble up through these little orifices. So there's some kind of a heat source underneath that might be extremely low, down way deep, and they don't feel the heat at the top, but the bubbles have to rise somehow. And they create a pressurization underneath, some bubbles escape, and by the time they get to the surface, they may not be heated. Let's go back to here again. I don't want you to miss anything. Here she goes. Is that he wants to see get interested in science. We got along well. The farmer was aware of this mud pot, well, but it looks he wasn't hot. worried because those are actually kind of common in the area. There's a large carbon dioxide reservoir. Carbon dioxide, remember that. Now, what is the gases that we just talked about? Hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide. Now, don't forget those two gases. In the Salton Sea air. Let me come back here. I, I don't want to miss it again. Here it goes. Actually, kind of common in the area. There's a large carbon dioxide reservoir in this. Large carbon dioxide reservoir, and you'll see this is very interesting. Salton Sea area has found a way up to the surface, but it's also hit a water table. So now you don't just get gas; you get a lot of water. So the island geyser started out as a mud pot, but became a mud spring. But it turns out scientists have never seen either of these move until this one. It's not a typical mud pot or a mud volcano where you just have this like small depression in the ground. So I, I think we would all classify it as a mobile mud spring. It was eventually named the Nylon Geyser, not Kyle. Despite the fact that it's neither a geyser nor a mud puddle. We're getting continuous flow of water versus a geyser like Yellowstone, but there's also steam, so there's some heat to it. This, there is no heat. You're not gonna touch it, and, you know, your hand's not gonna boil. One day. All right, now remember that there's not a lot of heat here. Now, there may be some, I don't know, but she said your hand's not going to burn, so that's, I'll take it at that. However, when they start talking about the depth that they were in, you'll understand how deep the source of the pressure is and how long it would take that heat to get to the surface, if what I'm saying is correct. Day. In 2016, the farmer noticed it had started to move. So by 2018, it had carved out such a large sunken crumble basin that it covered an area half the size of a football field. This is the first moment that I mentioned, because in 2018, the mud spring, that just the water part, was well over 100 feet across. And it was steadily approaching its first human civilization speed bump the Union Pacific train tracks. So obviously the railroad had to act fast to try and save the tracks, so they brought in the engineering firm Shannon and Wilson, who Carolina works for, that's when she came in, and they attempted to stop the mud spring. The railroad actually started putting in a large rock 
and the rock disappeared. This is a bucket of smooth sand with an inlet for air to bubble up through the sand. Watch what happens when I turn on the air. Some of the rubber duckies and stuff will float around, but some of the dense objects will immediately sink to the bottom as the sand starts to act strangely like a fluid. Now imagine adding some water to this and you would get something perhaps worse than quicksand. That's what's going on with the Nylon Geyser. This is one of the many reasons that you wouldn't want to fall in there. So that is why all the rocks that the railroad just threw in disappeared. They sunk, which meant... I want you to look at these borderline areas. They sunk all those rocks in there. Yeah, absolutely, because there was plenty of place for them to go. That there was also no telling you how deep the hole was. You see this? This is tissue layers. And she's right, there is no telling how deep the hole was. But I can tell you what the hole was. And that terrifying fact would very soon create a massive problem. Because by June of 2018, the mud spring had moved dangerously close to the river. You see how this was the big hole here and it jumped across? They're going to talk about how, it, I don't know whether it jumped here or there, whatever, but when it then all of a sudden exploded because they couldn't contain it. Railroad tracks. So Union Pacific installed a 140 foot wide sheet pile wall to try and block the mud puddle. And they dug it down to the insane depth of a five story building. And then they drilled wells to drain water and relieve the hydrostatic pressure. And then on the morning of October 3rd, engineers on site heard a loud now, while all of this is going on, recall that there's continual CO2 bubbling up. CO2 bubbling up, that's carbon dioxide. There are dangerous gases that come out of it that can be lethal. I have another experiment for you. Watch what happens when I stick a candle in this cup. It just goes out. Can you guess what's in the cup? It's carbon dioxide. I made the CO2 by mixing baking soda and vinegar, and CO2 is more dense than air, so it'll just sit there in my cup or at the Nylon Geyser, it'll just sit there over the hole, which means that if you fell in and could miraculously swim, you would quickly suffocate due to the lack of oxygen. Whew, you really don't want to fall in. In the morning, yeah. sometimes, when it's cold, this the gas cold. won't rise, and so it looks like a fog. Now that CO2 is not only deadly to us, it's the unrelenting driving force of all the erosion digging thousands of square feet, and it's now bubbling up against that wall. CO2 bubbling up against the wall that they put in to restrict the movement of this water which was expanding. And the CO2 is coming out, um, the uh, hydrogen sulfide is coming out, which is what we call rotting egg smell. And then the coolest part I actually missed was when the mud spring was right up against the sheet pile wall. We'd noticed the piles deflecting towards the spring and so I started making observations okay well it's tilted this much or now I'm seeing cracks behind the sheet piles now I'm hearing hissing sound like a gas trying to escape now I'm seeing liquid come out of these cracks I get this train out of here yeah move this train out the train has to leave hey let's pull the train out of here just get, this, just get the train out of here Good idea. About 120 um, this just happened here in the last five minutes there was Proceeded by a bunch of gas coming out. We backed up and this whole area just collapsed. It's cracking right here. We're still losing it. And sure enough, there was a huge explosion and the mud spring had gone beneath the sheet piles and it eroded, eroded, eroded to the surface and then let off all of this pressure. And I. Let me just mention something. One side had the mud pole. All right. One side had the mud pole. I don't see any mud here. It's just a big open hole. Where's the mud? There's the wall. The mud puddle apparently is on that side. All right, so let's come back here a second. I don't want to miss anything. Okay, so here she's got the wall. And it's bubbling gases. Let's listen to what it's got to say. Thousands of square feet. And it's now bubbling up against that wall. And then the coolest part I actually missed was when the mud spring was right up against the sheet pile wall. We'd noticed the piles deflecting towards the spring. And so I started making observations, okay, well, it's tilted this much, or now I'm seeing cracks behind the sheet piles. Now I'm hearing hissing sound like a gas. All right, now don't forget, this one side is completely a gigantic mud puddle, and they just wanted to try to stop it from coming over here. And they, there's no way they could stop it trying to escape. 
Now I'm seeing liquid come out of these cracks. All right, it was coming underneath, and it was bubbling up in there, and all of a sudden, bloof, it, everything just collapsed at once, apparently. Right, and it's almost at the railroad now. Bunch of gas. And this whole area just collapsed. The whole area just collapsed. No water yet over here. They were trying to keep it from getting here. But it was a pocket that wanted to accept that water. And I will show you exactly what it was. You better get out of the way. And sure enough, there was a huge explosion. And the mud spring had gone beneath the sheet piles and it eroded, eroded, eroded to the surface and then let off all of this pressure. And I was not there for that. Within an hour of my leaving the site, now there was this new mud spring on the other side of the sheet pile walls. The mud spring had jumped beneath a 75 foot deep sheet pile wall. That's what the crack of the engineers had heard was. This whole thing reads like a novel, <laughs> but it wasn't even the craziest part. The final moment that I want to share with you was when the water and mud unexpectedly shot 100 feet into the air. But first, we got to have an ending to the biography of Kyle so far. So it passed the sheet pile wall, which was crazy. And then it eventually got to the railroad and passed the tracks. And so now it's between the tracks and the highway and it's not slowing down. So just like the railroad, the highway is currently having to get creative. And that is what I talked to Sean about. It was so interesting. The specifics of the issues that they solve. There's no other location in California. Actually, to my knowledge, this is the only mud pot that is actually moving in the world. It wasn't just like, oh, dig around a mud puddle. The gas comes up and then it goes out. These people are... All right. I don't see any reason to go any further because I'm going to show you exactly what it is. And it was the lung that I showed you in the beginning. The earth is completely littered with the bodies of gigantic creatures. I cannot account for that. Remember, they said mud pots in that area are common. This one is huge and on the move. Now, when I started, I said this is the source of the problems that we saw. And that right there is the mud puddle. I'm going to show you this in a microscope. Remember, I am telling you this is a lung. You see that big hole there? That's where the mud is going down. And you see how the big, big channels that go down in there? You can't, you can't drain this. There's nothing you can do. You put more rocks and rocks. That goes so deep, it's unbelievable. Because what we're really looking at is something that might be 500 feet deep, 1,000 feet deep, or more. And they're all over these mud pockets, all over the place. That's what happens on a lung. You have all these little orifices. Now, that is literally blood, and they call it a mud pot. Mud is nothing more than clay with watery substances in it. Clay is nothing more than blood with other minerals within it. Flesh, blood, tendinous material, bone, calcium. That's what creates mud. That's all it is. This is more bloody mud. Now, we're going to look at this in a microscope right now, and I will show you exactly how that thing formed and why it formed and why it's a very serious source of an issue that we need to address. We can't just walk away from our obligations to our, our Earth. It's time to just stop this nonsense and ha set up some kind of a commission that says, look, we all own Earth. We've got to do something, and we've got to do it damn quick. All right, we're going to go into looking in the microscope right now. Okay, my friends, that is the lung. And I am saying right there is where this problem is happening. And lungs emit exactly the same gases. And I will show you why they couldn't plug this hole up. Now we're going to go up to the microscope. It's under the microscope. I have to turn the lights off. And it will take a second to, to come up. Hold on one second. Crank this baby up here. Okay, now here's what we're looking at is what I am saying is that lung. Well, it is the lung that I, that I was just showing you, but I am saying this is also a source of that pot and why it moved. And it's very, very simple to see exactly what happened. These are extremely deep wells, and that is 
the vessel that feeds all of the other blood supply, or, or actually oxygen supply. Air runs through that normally, and through these whole things, and that's how you breathe. Now, this thing here was all of a sudden started bubbling up from somewhere. Now, either this side or that side, doesn't matter. But this is the border between the two. Now, let me see if I can adjust this in a little closer. We can come right down and look at it right on top of it. But this is the long distance shot, so you can get the lay of the land. Now, that's a little better. All right. We saw this. If you remember, we're going to come down and look at it. We saw, like, layering between where the thing was sinking because there's layers of tissue. There's literally layers. Now, we may not be able to see them all that well. I'm going to come right down on top of it. It takes a second to home in and focus and stuff. I have to move it. And I really don't have a stable platform, but we will make do with what we got. Now, what are we looking at? We are looking at the border between the two holes. The mud pot was either on this side or that side. I don't care which one. And they tried to plug it up and it bubbled up under and exploded out. One or the other side. And, um, and there is no stopping it because these blood vessels go extremely deep as you will see. You see down in there? It goes down and then there's another one underneath it. See it? And what they have bubbling up is mud. And what is mud, Roger? Well, mud is blood. And is blood and other minerals and, and, and fleshy bits that mix up with the water. As, as, and that's what these mud pots are. Now, and then they're all over the place. As we saw before, there are all these little ones are all over. See, and there's one there, there they're everywhere. Now, this is the normal blood that was in this thing. Hold on, let me back up. I got to come. Give me a second. Give me a second. Take it easy. Slow down. You move too fast. You got to make the moment last. Here we go. Bada bing. There it is. That's blood. Now, why are we seeing blood here? We don't see it anywhere else. All brown out here. Why? Well, I broke this off. <laughs> because you can go inside where the blood is very easy. You just got to break it off. Get inside. Chick -chick -chick boop. Out it goes in the blood. All right, now, that we saw that big hole right there. There it is right there. You see the size of it? Compared to the other ones? Well, it's the main inlet. That's why. They said all these little mud pots are all over the place there. Well, guess where this exact same rock is? And where it came from? And what we could do to test the chemistry of it and so forth. Because I know exactly what to look for. You see the black spots? Black is vein blood. It's the, the used blood. This is the fresh blood that was going to be pumped down to, to facilitate life. You know, and of course the thing died, and that was it. Now, let's see what they just happened to have sitting over there at the White House. You see what it says there? Moon rock now on display in the Oval Office at the White House. It's the same rock, <laughs> only this came from the moon. But I can guarantee you, if I can look at this and look at that, and we can compare them, and we can do the chemistry, and we can do the, the basically, an autopsy to prove one way or the other. That came from the moon. Everything I have found in space is is biological. All of the stuff that hits the earth, even the the iron meteorites, this the biggest meteorite that they have, I believe, the iron one, I think it's called a William meteorite, is exactly like this, only it's iron now. But you could still see all of the... Well, let's go look at it. All right, if this was examined carefully, you would see that it's exactly like this. When this came through space and into the Earth's atmosphere, it smelted. That's all they do to take iron and turn it in. I mean, take 
um, hematite, which is the red blood, and turn it into iron. If you look in some of these little holes, which I have, you'll actually be able to see red blood. It's still in there, and you'll actually be able to find it. And that is what you're looking at right there, only this one smelted, this one didn't, and this one's a little smaller. Now watch this. All right, here's another iron meteorite. When I say iron, it's all kinds of different metals. You see how they're all different crystallized in different ways? Blood, which is nothing more than what a heart or lungs are made of, liver even as well. They're literally bags of iron and transition metals. They were, it's exactly right here. Well, it's all kinds of stuff, but primarily you have all these different colored metals and crystal shapes and so forth, and that's exactly what it is. Now, what is this? Black. What is that? Red. I don't know if you can see it or not. You go up to where red is. You see that? That's red, red, red. It's about as red as you get. And that right there is black, black, black. And that is about as black as you get. Alright, are we on the same page? Yes, Roger, we are. Well, what is going on there? How could you explain that? Well, it's either a heart or a lung or a liver. But it's certainly one of the saturated organs with blood because there's not enough fibers in here to do anything different. They cook off coming through the atmosphere. They're the weak stuff, the cheap stuff, which burns off and smelts just like a smelter. At 18, I think it's 1835 degrees, somewhere around there. Iron pretty much separates from all this chaff and you just smoosh it off and you pour your iron off. Now, there's all kinds of metals in here. But it's, it, it, let's just go with it. it's, an, it's an iron meteorite. Or they would call that an iron meteorite. It's a, it's a, a heavy metals because all of the unheavy metals, the cheap stuff burns off. It turns into combustion. It bonds with oxygen and so forth and burns off. Okay, let's just sum it up. The gases that were coming out of the mud puddle there that's moving were CO2, which is coming out of your lungs, just like you breathe, hydrocarbons, which is methanes. Those come out of your lungs when you breathe. People don't talk about it, but they do. You can look it up. And then hydrogen sulfide, which is, comes out of your lungs when you breathe. And it comes, as I showed you, in the lung test. They're even testing for it now because it shows that there's an issue with some kind of damage in your body to the bacteria. Now, mud is nothing more than water and clay. And what is clay? Clay is nothing more than flesh and blood and connective tissue all in a slurry. Now, what is the mud pot area? That's all of those little holes and blood vessels I showed you. Decades it's been fine. They knew this for a decades, but that was when they probably first started drilling for oil and things, and the water table started shifting a little bit. But recently, it's just gone insane. Why? Well, it's because of drilling and fracking and damaging the earth. I don't know if it's just a death throw. Or, I don't know what to say anymore. I really don't. It needs to be looked at. If somebody wants to contact me, it's roger at mudfossils with an S dot com. Thank you.